Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning as we gather together to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of announcements here for us. Um, the Christmas baskets, we'll still be doing that, and so we do encourage um, all of our committees to provide a Christmas basket for a fundraiser and anybody else who would be willing to donate for that. Uh, we do need the baskets by the 4th, and our drawing will be held on the 17th of December at 12 p.m., and so on that day we'll be having a combined service. And so uh, if you have any questions in regards to this, please contact Randy. Not only that, we also have our 93rd annual turkey dinner here. Uh, I was told that the date in here is incorrect. Is that, is that the case? Or is this the right date? Fourth. It's the 4th, okay. So it's supposed to be the 4th, so just let all of us know that. So, was that? <laughs> yeah, so. The 4th, is that Saturday? Yes. Yeah, 4th is Saturday. Yeah, so. The time is correct, right? 4.30 to 7? Everything else is correct? Okay, so please be here for that. Um, I would not be here on the 8th. I'll be going, I'll be going to uh, Fresno to attend my cousin's uh, wife's funeral there in Fresno. And so Tracy will be the speaker for that combined service. So just let us know that. And also just let us know that right after our worship service, I'll be going back to Sacramento for another funeral. So last week was a member was a member of our church here that had his funeral, and this week it's a member of the Sacramento church that um, is having his funeral. And so um, then a couple of weeks after that, I'll be going to Fresno for my cousin's uh, wife's funeral. So three Hmong funerals in four weeks, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so um, I've never had that happen before, but uh, yeah, I'll, be going, I'll be attending that. And so any other announcements at this time? First, first, a public service announcement. 91 shopping days left. So, sitting over here is Darby Miller, trying to act nonchalant. Jerry, Jerry, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, she sold her house. I mean, it's sold. So we're gonna have a, we're gonna miss you party at the coffee hour for her. So we will all really miss you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And um, I want to thank Betty for bringing the cake today for uh, Jerry's special day and for Louise doing all of the around stuff. So we're, we're covered. So that's good. But we're not covered for next Sunday. Next Sunday, there's nobody signed up for coffee hour, and I'm not going to be here. I'll be gone. I'll be in New Brunswick, Canada by next Sunday. So uh, hopefully somebody will step forward and put their name on the, the list for a coffee hour so that you can all share, you know, some time afterward because it's, it's really special to us. I also wanted to mention that um, Jim and Janet are on their way home from their trip to Greece. They got COVID and got kicked off the cruise ship. So they're on their way home, which is so sad. I mean, it hasn't been good even from the start, so that's, that's one more thing. Um, and Glenda has got COVID, so we'll be doing circle here at the church at one o'clock tomorrow, right here at the church. We're doing chapter one of the book by Max Lucado, uh, Before Amen. If nobody's got, if you need it, I've got them right here. Uh, uh, Glenda or somebody put them on my doorstep so I could have them here. And we'll be doing chapter one tomorrow. So I'm hoping everybody who would normally come and those who haven't, don't usually come will come and just share some time all together and praying for ah, so much these days. Um, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alma. Any other announcements? Jerry, can I have you come up here, Jerry? Can you come up here, please? I just want to pray for you. I'm gonna miss you. Yeah, we're gonna miss you. We're gonna miss you so much. Okay. Yeah, so God be with you. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. My cell phone went out. My phone goes. 
Oh, really? Yeah. I'll pray for you. Well, before I pray for Jerry, I just want to give us an opportunity to come up and just to say bye to her or just, yeah, just say a couple words to her before she, she goes today. It's going to be her last day. And um, after that, I'll pray for her and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So, Jerry, I'm going to pray for you, okay? I'm going to pray for you. So, if you're able to, please stand with me and let us pray for Jerry. Lord, we come into your presence. We come to thank you so much for all the memories, all the times that we've shared together, for all the love that we have shared, Lord. We thank you so much for our sister, Jerry. No matter where she may be at, she will always be our sister. She will always be a part of our church. Lord, as she is getting ready to move to Texas, Lord, we ask that you bless her, be with her, protect her, guide her, continue to watch over her, and continue to bless her, Lord. Keep her safe, keep her healthy till we meet again, Lord. We thank you so much 
for her presence. We thank you so much for all the things that you've blessed us with. We thank you so much for her, for just having her to be a part of our church. We'll always be in gratitude to you, Lord, for blessing us with her presence. We pray for her and we lift her up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Now it's time for us to go do the call to worship, so please stand if you're able to. (laughs) Join me for the call to worship. Wisdom cries out in the streets. Come and listen to the words of life and love. Let us worship the God of life and wisdom. In this time of worship, let us truly know what it means to be a follower of Christ. May the words of your ways be spoken to us. Turn your hymnals to 420, 420, and breathe on me, breath of God. Let us pray together. Lord, may your grace fall down upon all of us at this moment. May you give us life. May your Holy Spirit come into our hearts, open up our hearts, our minds to you. During this time of worship, Lord, may we see your face. May we be transformed through and by your words, Lord. We thank you so much. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated at this time. It's time for our choir anthem.
Thank you so much for our choir. May God continue to bless all of you. At this time, it is time for our Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading this morning is from Proverbs 1, uh, verses 7 to 9. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. The word of God for the people of God. Please stand with me if you're able to turn your hymnals to page 432, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. At this time, it's time for us to share our joys and our concerns, and you may be seated. Um, Bob just had uh, surgery on his face. Uh, He has had a a melanoma taken off. And uh, so you probably wonder how come he's all patched up. So I thought I'd tell you. He's fine. You didn't know that, huh? Huh? (laughs) 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 Prayers for you, Bob. Yes, I wanted to ask for prayers for those who have COVID. I mean, it seems to be a real virulent strain. So, uh, you know, there's so little we can do. But... uh, just uh, wearing masks, all that kind of thing helps for sure. And I also wanted to say, as this is a joy, uh, that our bishop is back with us. Uh, they voted. She had, I mean, it's been three years, I think, that she's been away from us with uh, um, Miss Dyke. Mrs. Dyke was the, our bishop 
for the time. And she, they went through the trial, um, took them, I think, three days, that was it, and they voted 13 to 0 that whatever happened, and I don't have a clue, uh, was not anything that she did. So she's back. She's back with us. And I think that's a real joy. You know, I can imagine how her life has been during these time, this time that she's been away and under a cloud, I'm sure. So I'm just thankful that she's back. Well, she's back, so that's good. Yeah, thank you, Jolene. Thank you for sharing that. Well, fortunately, I have two joys. One is, is a good childhood friend of mine, uh, Lynn Morosi. His daughter is having a, a baby, probably as we are sitting here talking. Uh, up in Seattle, and she's up there with her, and it's been 20 hours. And I said, sounds, sounds like a kidney stone. <laughs> but I guess it hasn't been all pain. I mean, she's had a few breaks. I didn't know that's what you did, but I guess nowadays you can have a break from your... <laughs> uh, and the other thing is, is a internet friend of ours, Steve Jelf, who is 83, he calls himself the Dauntless Geezer, and it, uh, he's one of these independent guys, just really independent. And he was driving his 1915 Model T Roadster uh, to the old car festival in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a big, big old car event. And he travels across a couple of states. He doesn't worry about getting the Model T and going. Well, he got T-boned. And the car looks like I'm surprised Steve's still with us. And he did damage an eye socket, and there's some other things. But he's pulling through. He's starting to tell jokes, and he's starting to be ornery like he usually is. So we're all very grateful that he's recovering. Thank you, David. I wanted to mention that uh, Gail is a little fury today because it would have been her mother's birthday. And so, and we miss the Browns, Margaret and John, here at the church because they were such a, a big part of us and our circle here. So uh, just prayers for Gail and for the family as they remember their grandma and great grandma. Thank you for sharing that prayers. Let us pray together. Lord, how wonderful you truly are. You're always amazing every time that we come before you. You're always perfect in all the things that you do. You can do no wrong. You created the heavens and the earth. You created all things. You breathe life into each and every single one of us. You continue to hold us in the palm of your hand. You continue to guide us and watch over us at all times, Lord. As we come before you this morning, we bring all of our joys and our concerns to you. Lord, we lift up Bob to you. We lift up all those people who have been affected by COVID. We lift them up to you. We lift up our bishop to you. We thank you so much for, for this trial to finally have some closure to it, Lord. We thank you so much. We thank you so much for bringing her back to be with us lead us. Lord, we pray for the new children, the new babies. We pray for those who got into a car accident. Lord, we pray also for Gail and her family as they remember their grandparents, Lord. We pray for all of us. We ask that you be with us all. Continue to strengthen us. Continue to build us up for your, your kingdom. Continue to bless us and love us. Continue to open up our hearts towards one another that we may serve each other as your son, Jesus Christ, served us. Allow us to love one another as you have loved us so much, Lord. We thank you so much for all these things. And once again, we thank you for our sister, Jerry. We ask that you just continue to be with her. We continue to lift her up to you. Lord, we love her so much and we are going to miss her so much, Lord. But we're confident that you'll always be with her no matter where she is at. 
Lord, we ask that you continue to bless our church, continue to bless our children, continue to bless everybody here in our congregation, that we may continue to grow in our faith. Whatever it is that may become a hindrance to our faith, Lord, we ask that you remove these things and just keep us close to you at all times. And so let us pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ once taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for a New Testament reading. The New Testament reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to, cha- to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. The wisdom of God. You know, many times for Hmong people, we always want to hear words of wisdom, especially when we have a a parent that passed away. One of the things that we do, we want someone, an elder in the community, to come to provide us with words of wisdom, to help us to be able to move on from the grief that we experience. Well, today, we'll be hearing some words of wisdom. Some words of wisdom that does not come from an elder, does not come from another person, but it comes directly from God himself. But of course, God is using someone here to write these words down for us. And in the case of Proverbs, God used a king to write these words down for us. His name is King Solomon. As we read the scriptures, as we study the Bible, we see that in the scriptures, God used many authors. Some of them were kings, some of them were prophets. Some of them were apostles. Even there was a medical doctor by the name of Luke who also wrote in the New Testament. But here in the book of Proverbs are the words of King Solomon, the son of King David. Now Solomon became king when he was around 20 years old after the death of his father, David. He ruled for about 40 years. He was the one that built the temple in Jerusalem. And he was the last king of a united kingdom for Israel. After his death, his son, Rehoboam, took over the throne. And there was a civil war. And Israel split into two countries, into two nations, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And yet out of all of King Solomon's accomplishments, one thing that stood out the most about him, at least for me, as I study his life and as I read about his life, the one thing that stands out about him was that when he had to ask God for something, the very thing that he asked God for was wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, in a dream, God said to King Solomon, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. 
In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9, Solomon responded to God by saying, Give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. And so in verse 10 to verse 14, God responded to Solomon by saying, The Lord is pleased. Oh, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or for wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be anyone like you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in, the, if, if you walk in obedience to me, and if you keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. And so for 40 years, Solomon, he ruled, and he was the king over Israel. And for those 40 years as he was the king over Israel, he spent many, many days just observing the people of his nation, the people of his country. And as he was observing their lives, he can tell which, which type of people were the people that were going to be successful and the type of people which were the people that were not going to be successful and that they were going to struggle with their lives. And because of his observation, what he did was he penned down these words. He wrote down these words to encourage his people and also to encourage us as to how we can go about to live a good life, to live a successful life, to live a life with the wisdom of God. And so he says here in verse 7, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now what Solomon is not saying in these verses here or in this verse, what Solomon is not saying is that he is not saying that knowledge cannot be attained apart from God because obviously it can. There's many different paths, there's many different ways for us to attain knowledge. But what Solomon is doing here is Solomon is pointing us to the fact that there is a source of knowledge and that this knowledge here is not any type of knowledge. But the word knowledge here in the Hebrew word talks about a divine kind of knowledge. It is the highest type of knowledge that we can attain in our lives. It is the highest type of knowledge. It is the way in which we can gain this knowledge. And it is the way that we can take this knowledge and we can apply this knowledge not only to ourselves, but that's where it starts. That we are to intellectually be able to attain this information, these facts, these objective reality, these objective truth, that, we're able to, that we need to be able to attain these things, but then not only are we able to attain it, the type of knowledge that Solomon was talking about is that when we attain that type of knowledge, how can we take that type of knowledge and how can we apply it to our spiritual and emotional self? So how do we apply that first to ourselves? And then, once we're able to apply that to ourselves, then how can we take that knowledge and also apply it to others, to our families and our relationship? How do we take that knowledge and apply it to our community, to our nation, to our country? And yes, even how do we take that and apply it to our relationship with even our enemies? But how can we take it? For example, we all know the fact is that God is good. Well, if God is good, how does that apply to me? How does that apply to me? Well, if God is good, how does that apply to my family? How does that apply to my relationship with my wife? How does that apply to my relationship with my children? How does that apply to my relationship with my community, with my nation, and with all the people across the globe? How does that even apply to those people that I disagree with? And so, so Solomon is, trying, is, is making a point here that we need to try to understand everything objectively. Even when we disagree with somebody, that our, our, our whole purpose is to, try to, to understand them from their point of view and not so much just from our own point of view. And so that way, in that sense, we can use the knowledge that we have 
and we can apply that into a relationship with other people. And so this is the type of knowledge that, that Solomon was referring to. But of course, he's also asking us, where does that knowledge come from? Where does that knowledge come from? But deeper than these things, what he's saying is that he is saying, what is the framework of your reality? What is that one framework in your life that determines the way you live your life? Determines the way that you relate to others? That determines the way that you relate to the world, to your environment, to all those people that are around us. Because that framework is what controls us. That framework is what dictates to us what our thoughts are, how we behave, and determines our relationship with other people. So these are the things that, that, that Solomon is trying to get at. It is our belief system. It is the, the things that we believe in, that it, it is so foundational to our lives. It is so foundational to the way that we obtain knowledge. It is so foundational to the way that we interpret the knowledge that we receive, that we interpret the information that we receive. And of course, where is that information coming from? What is your source of information? And so, so Solomon is saying, yes, we can get knowledge from all these different sources. We can learn, we can gather knowledge from all these different sources. But then the real knowledge, the real information, the, the real truth for us comes only when we are in this relationship with God. And the word fear here, when, when Solomon is talking about fear here, what Sol Solomon is talking about is he's not talking about the type of fear that would draw us away from God. He's not talking about the type of fear that, that will cause us to run away from God. But he's talking about the type of fear, like how we fear our parents. That when we fear them, then we, we give them respect. The type of fear that results in respect and reverence to God. And reverence to God for who he is. And reverence to God for his will. And reverence to him for, in his will. To respect his will, to respect who he is. That's what he has revealed to us. And so that's the type of, of fear that... That, that Solomon is trying to communicate here to us, and he's saying that this is where true knowledge actually starts. There is a beginning. There is a beginning, right? We see, and we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that Moses talks about a beginning also. And so here in these verses, Solomon is following the very same thing, that there is a beginning there is a source where that ultimate knowledge, that true knowledge, that divine knowledge, the highest level of knowledge comes from. And it comes from God. It comes from knowing God. It comes from having this reverence for who God is. And so what you believe in today, what you believe in, how you think about God, how you think about God determines, it's going to determine the way that you apply the knowledge that you have been given. How you think about God is going to determine the way in which you also attain the information in your life. It really comes from that. So we have to ask ourselves that question, well, how do we think about God? I mean, there's, there's three different ways of thinking about God. The very basic ways, the three ways. One way is monotheism, the, the belief that there is only one God very unique to Judeo-Christianity. And then there's also the idea of polytheism, that there's many, many gods. Do we believe that there are many, many gods? And then, of course, nowadays we have atheism, that there is no God. And we have to understand that Moses was writing the Torah or the Pentateuch in the context of these, these worldviews. And so to Moses, he was arguing for the existence of only one God while he was living in a culture of many different gods. And today we're living in this culture of atheists, this atheistic culture in which we, many people are starting to move towards that idea of no God. But you see, the end result is pretty much the same thing. Because whether you have no God or you have many gods, it ends up being the same thing. Because when there is no God, then we become our own God. 
When we become our own God, then there's many different gods. Because each of us is a God. And that's the whole concept of the Egyptian culture that Moses grew up in. And that's the whole thing that Moses was trying to argue against when he says in the beginning, yeah, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so he's taking everything, all these ideas of these many gods in which you have your own God, I have my own God. This nation has their own God, that nation has their own God. And many of the, the gods in these different nations are really about you know, just, just, just that people, promotes this national, nationalistic view of, of the world. That, we're, that you know, even in, in the traditional Hmong religion, it's just the religion is about the Hmong people. It's not about a universal love. But here Moses is coming, and Moses is saying that there is a God, that there is this universal love that brings all of us together. And that's, that's his whole argument, trying to get back into this idea or trying to promote this idea of just having one God. And that's, what, that's the same thing Solomon is trying to bring us towards, is that that absolute knowledge, that, that greatest knowledge, that highest level of knowledge that we can attain has to come from this God. That has, has to, there is a source, and it, it is, that source is in this very one God. And that must be the framework for our lives. That must be the belief system. And that's the, that's the way that we can interpret the information that we have in a healthy way. The information that we're able to attain, we can, we can use that in a way to help each other, to build each other up, if we have that healthy framework in us. And so that's where it begins. Nowadays, some of the frameworks that we have, um, we have two congregations here, so, so the Hmongs, the framework, that the, the way that they think about life is they think about life in terms of community. The way that, that Western, us, those of us who grew up here in the Western society, when we think about life, we think about life more as individual. It's an individualistic idea of life. So we have these different framework in which we approach life. And sometimes when you look at these frameworks, it determines the way in which we respond to our ministry within the church. It, it determines the way in which we relate to one another. And if you take this idea of individualism way too far, it becomes unhealthy for you. While at the same time, if you take this idea of community way too far, it also becomes unhealthy for you. And so a lot of times when, when, when we're doing the home ministry, we try to bring them to that realization that the idea of community is good, but it can only go so far. Because when you take it too far, then no one is able to, to be their own. No one is able to think for themselves anymore. You have to go along with what the group says all the time. And you don't have that independence anymore. And that's why I, I always encourage, I, I encourage us to participate in the Hmong ministry, especially with the, when they have funerals and things like that, because we can see the changes that, that's happening in their, in their culture. And we can see the changes that's happening in the way that they approach these things that are very important to them in their lives. And so you want to do the best. So we have these different frameworks that, that we approach life with. But we want to, be the, we want to do what's, what's best for everybody. And we want to find the best way to approach life. And that really does come down to having a balanced view of life. Because if you take this individualistic idea of life, you take it to ex extreme, which many people often do, then you lose your entire family. Or you lose your relationship with your parents, you lose your relationship with your brothers and sisters, you lose your relationship with other people. You're, you're, all, you're, you're by yourself, pretty much. And so we need to find a way how to balance these things. But these are different frameworks in which we used to approach life. And to, to Solomon, his argument was and is that that framework comes from God. That we need to have a healthy view of God. We need to, be, we need to respect God for who he is. And it is at that, with that starting point, it is with that starting point that we'll be able to apply that knowledge in a way that's beneficial for the entire world, for, that's beneficial for one another. He goes on and he, said, he talks about those who, who um, despise 
wisdom and instruction. He calls them fools. And in his word, as he calls them fools, what he's saying here is that these people, those who despise God, those who, who, are, who don't want to know God, they are people who don't know what's right from wrong. They can't discern right from wrong. They, they are people who are not humble, right? When, when you despise God, when, when you're against God, when, when you don't believe in God, then, then, this, then, then he's referring to them as, as people who are just not humble. They, they, they prefer to indulge in all kinds of their own fleshly desires, and even many times they, they would judge God. So when he talks about people who are fools, this is what he's referring to. He's referring to those who reject God. He's referring to those who are not humble. He's referring to those people who just don't know what's right from wrong, and they just indulge in whatever kind of desire that they have, and they can't control themselves. A lot of times when we read the scripture, it often talks a lot about being self-control, or being able to control yourselves from these, these desires that you may have. And so when, when, when Solomon's talking about fools, that's what he's talking about, it's people who just simply don't have any self-control. And, that, and we don't have that. He's saying that they don't have that because they, they despise wisdom. They despise wisdom, which is they despise God. They don't, they don't believe in God. They don't trust in God. They don't believe that there is a God. And so, so what, what he's ta- telling here, us here, too, is that he's also telling us here that as we're seeking for these wisdom, as we're looking for this, that we need to understand that there, there must be this right this right foundation that we must build our wisdom, our knowledge on. That there is a right and a wrong foundation. So even though we can find knowledge from anywhere, that the right foundation is to find knowledge in God and who God is. And that God has made this available for us. That God has made this type of wisdom available for us. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20 to verse 21, it says, Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. In James chapter 1, verse 5, James says, If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And so, so what, what Solomon is saying is that, yes, there, there's this right foundation, there's this place where we need to start that, that will lead us in the right direction to finding the, the, the highest level of knowledge. But then at the same time, it's not like this knowledge is now hidden from you because God has not hide this from you. God has made this available for you. All you have to do is seek for it. All you need to do is search for, for this wisdom and you will find it. And for those who are, who are refusing to find or to seek after wisdom, to seek after knowledge, what's going to happen is that in their simplicity, that this is going to eventually destroy them, right? Without searching for knowledge, without searching for, for this wisdom that comes from God, we're simply going to destroy ourselves. He says the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, referring to wisdom, will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. So the beneficial of seeking wisdom is to be able to live free of fear, right? To be able to live in a way that that our lives are at ease. But without this wisdom, when trouble comes, it can easily destroy us. So as he's giving us this foundation here that we need to find it upon God, He's also saying, well, once you, once you build this foundation correctly, you also need to be proactive in seeking that wisdom. You can't just say, I believe in God, and I just leave it there, and I stop. But, there, but there's more to that. That's only the beginning. The, the fear of God, that's only the beginning. The belief in God, the reverence for God, that's only the beginning. But you need to continue to seek for God. Continue to grow your grow in the wisdom of God. And you do that because God has already provided that for you. That it's free. It's there for you. God has opened up that wisdom for you. All you have to do is seek after it. Because if you don't seek after that type of wisdom, you don't seek after the wisdom of God, then eventually the wisdom, whatever wisdom that you may have, a wisdom that comes from another source, a wisdom that comes from the ways of the world, that will eventually, all that would do is just destroy you. 
So don't be complacent in, 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 in your relationship with God. Don't, don't, think that I, don't, don't believe yourself to, to believe that you've already arrived because you have not already arrived. There's still more room for you to go. There's, it's there, there's still more wisdom for you to learn. And sometimes one of, the, one of the pastors said to me, you know, he said to me, Pastor Chang, I've completed my PhD, so I'm done. And I told him, you're not done. The Word of God says we're never done, right? We're never done in the way that we seek for wisdom. And so we need to understand that, that, that we're never done. We're never done. As we're seeking for God, as we're seeking for this wisdom from God, we're never done. And so we must not be, you know, we must not find ourselves just staying there and, and, and not growing anymore, but we need to continue to seek for it because God will continue to give us what this, this wisdom for us. And so we need to become someone who loves to learn. Be a person who loves to learn. Be the person that learns about things. Be, be a person, person that, that when you learn about things, then you can take those things that you learn about and you can help other people with it. You can support, you can build other people up. You know, so many people, they say, I, I don't want to learn because, you know, I have so many people to help me already, so I don't need to learn anything, and people will just come and help me whenever I need something. But the Bible says it is better for us to give than to receive. And so what God is telling us here, here is that it is better for us to be the one that's out there, that we're learning, that we're growing in our wisdom, that we're growing in our knowledge, so that we can use that wisdom, we can use that knowledge to help other people out. That's what it means to be blessed. Instead of just being the one who never learns, and you're always sitting back and depending on someone else to come and support you. So God is encouraging us. He's always encouraging us to continue to grow in our wisdom, to continue to seek knowledge. And so we have to love and we have to desire these things, these words of these instructions and these teachings. It teaches us here that for us to listen to our parents, but many times, sometimes when our parents teach us, what do we do? Sometimes when our parents teach us, we ignore it, right? Sometimes when our family comes and gives us instructions, some of us, we get offended. Sometimes when the pastor preach, we, we get up and we leave. We don't want to hear the words of the pastors. But, but the Word of God is telling us here that we must be people who love teachings. We must be people who desire for instructions in our lives. And this is how we are to grow. You know, I, I see so many young people that they would save themselves so much trouble if all they did was either listen to their parents, their, their elders, or their pastor and their church leaders. But so many of them, they will ignore all these things, right? They will ignore their parents, they'll ignore their church, they'll ignore their family, they'll ignore their elders, their leaders, they'll ignore all these things, they'll, they'll, they'll try to, they'll do things themselves, and a lot of times that causes them a lot of stress in their life. A lot of times that, that hurts them a lot, and so... The Bible teaches us about these things. God has put these authorities in our lives to help us grow. That doesn't mean that we're always going to have perfect parents. It doesn't mean that we're always going to have a perfect family. It doesn't mean that we're always going to have a perfect pastor. But th this is part of what God has given to us to really help us grow in this life. And so Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And he even encourages us that they are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. And so we need, we need to learn how to be lovers of instructions and desire these teachings. The last point I want to point out for us is also this, that the Bible teaches us here in these verses here, that we need to find the right friends. We need to find the right people to be around with. I know there's a saying that says, show me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 makes it very simple. It says, walk with the wise to become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. And so if we want to, be, we want to have knowledge, we need to, to be around people who want to have knowledge. We want to be wise, we need to be around people who are wise. We want to be rich, be successful, we need to be around those types of people. If you hang around with people who party and drink all the time, well, what's, guess what's going to happen? You're going to party and drink all the time. If you hang, ar if you hang around with people who are, are, are passionate about serving God, that's going to help you become more passionate about serving God. 
But if all the people that you hang around with are people who don't even want to go to church, that they have no passion for the Lord, then you're, you're going to end up with no passion for the Lord. And so the Bible tells us here, the Bible is teaching us here, that those that, that we associate with is also very important. For us to find knowledge, we also need to be able to associate ourselves, hang out, or be friends with, with those who can support us in finding out what this knowledge is really about. And so the four things for us to remember today is that the beginning of knowledge comes from the fear of the Lord. And that as we, we build our foundation, that we must continuously seek for wisdom and knowledge. And that we must also become people who love instructions. And that we must also become people who desire teachings. And we must also find ourselves to be around the right kind of people that can support us in our search for knowledge. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for just being here with us this morning, Lord. We thank you so much for your words of wisdom. We thank you so much for Solomon that you use him to write down these words for us thousands and thousands of years ago, Lord. We ask that you can encourage us as we continue to seek for your wisdom, as we continue to grow in our faith. And we thank you so much in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's time for us to do our offertory. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for always blessing us. We thank you so much for always just leading us to be in your church, to come before you to worship you, Lord. As part of our worship today, we bring you these tithes and these offerings for the sake of your name, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you bless these offerings. We thank you so much. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, please remain standing. Turn your hymnals to 671. 671, Lord, dismiss us with thy blessings.
to you all. You may be seated at this time. May the wisdom of the Lord guide you in all the things that you do until we meet again. God bless.